This is my Skippy Pi project. So I bought some new uh, test devices. So this shows how I set up a program to connect through Skippy uh, to my test devices, oscilloscopes, multimeters, and things like that, and automate scripts and be able to chart the results of those. Those scripts, it's using a Raspberry Pi W and a Angular client application. This project got started when I bought a new uh, desktop uh, digital multimeter and it had a record function on it, but it didn't work very well. So that caused me to go down the track of looking at the built-in uh, automation function through the USB hub on the back of the device. So I've got a few test instruments on my desktop now. So this sort of led me down the path of being able to automate all of them and have them working together. So I thought I'd have a look at what I ended up putting together, uh, show it how it's used for automation, and then uh, come back around and look at some of the technical details for anyone who's interested in the second half of this. So I put together a, a Angular application and it's talking to uh, uh, web services on a little Raspberry Pi W that's talking to the test devices. So in the Angular application, I've got sort of a tab interface to allow for the three things I wanted to do. So one is just look at the devices so I can do things like click on volts DC for my desktop multimeter and I'll do a connect and uh, show you the current voltages. Uh, I may also want to use some of my oscilloscopes. So uh, here I've set up uh, uh, the Siglent oscilloscope and I can read things like the peak to peak voltage off there or maybe the frequency off there and at the moment that's connected to my signal generator so I can also play with this so let's change it down to 1000 Hertz maybe 2 volts and use a sine wave apply that And we see the frequency on the oscilloscopes drop down to a thousand. If I look at the peak to peak voltage, it's shown pretty close to two volts. There's a bit of discrepancy between the two dev devices. So that's good just for a basic interface to all my devices, uh, safe walking up to them and turning some of the knobs. Uh, but the thing I really wanted to do was to automate it. So if, uh, let's do an example here. Let's call it example. And I want to set up an automation. So in most cases, I want to do this for a period of time and take readings off the devices every so often. So let's say every one second, I want to get a reading off the oscilloscope and we'll have it run for a maximum of 5,000 seconds. I want to use the signal generator. I'll tell it I want to start at about 20 hertz. Uh, step factor, probably uh, uh, let's go at 1.59. 1.059 uh, times per step. So basically that's a semitone, so it's a good way to get a logarithmic scale. And we'll stop it. We won't go very high. We'll go to 10,000 hertz. And we'll run it at 1 volts. Uh, also I want to add a device to get the measurements off. So let's go back to devices over on the Siglent oscilloscope. We'll get the peak to peak and have that be the thing that we measure. So using this, I can generate up a script, and it ends up being a Python script. I can save it onto the Raspberry Pi Zero, where all the work's done. And I'll show you in the technical details kind of how all this was put together. But I now have a script that I can run that's going to do these automation tasks. So basically run through the frequency response from 20 up to a, uh, 10,000 hertz, change the value every one second, and let's run that. So it's starting the Pi script. It's getting everything set up. And now it's running through this the steps here. And while that's running, we can actually go over to the charts. I can see if I've got any charts for this yet. So example, let me get the data. There may not be much to see yet. So we'll graph frequency against the peak-to-peak -peak values, draw the chart, and you see I only got a little bit here so far, so 
may have to wait a little while and I'll fast forward through this and then show you the end result. I keep going back to automation just to see how this is progressing. So up to 300 hertz. And we'd expect this to be a fairly much a flat line chart in the end because we're just going straight from the signal generator to the oscilloscope that's measuring the peak to peak voltage. So there's a bit of jumpiness here. I think it's more to do with my oscilloscope just being an 8 bit one that I'm using at the moment. But you can see how this is useful if I wanted to get a, say, a bowed chart, I could. Uh, run it through an RC filter or something and see how the frequency or the, the power level changes over frequency. That's good. Let's have one last look at the chart. So again, we'll go down to the example chart I just created. Frequency versus peak to peak value. Draw the chart and we see it's pretty much flat across all the frequencies we saw there. Things I put into this for automation is to be able to save an automation. So if I am in automation and I go to load and I can go and choose, say, this Rigol version of a Bode chart. So same things running through uh, all the steps for 500 seconds. Uh, this time it's going from 20 hertz, going up by a semitone again, going up to 40,000 hertz. I'm running at 3 volts uh, this time and I'm using my Rigol oscilloscope, it's got 12 bits uh, resolution so it should give you much clearer uh, charts. So I'm using DHO804 uh, for that and I'm getting the peak to peak voltage and I'm actually also doing the phase difference between the input and the output phases on a RC cell circuit. So again, we can do a generate run it and we can have a look at what I got as an output from that. I've already run this. So if I go to that Bode Rigol, get the data so I can graph frequency against, let's do peak to peak first, draw the chart and here we see a much smoother chart I think because of the Rigol oscilloscope. But I know I've got a uh, uh, a resonance frequency of about 480 hertz and you can see here at that point here which is about 2.3 volts maybe about here uh, it's down 3 dB and 3 dB is 0.707 of the peak voltage so the difference in dB is 0.707 and when I work that out that would be about 2.1 volts and you see it comes in at about 470 hertz and we can also do the same thing with phase. So let's draw the phase over here. I think I need a filter because I've got some weird phase results in this one. So let's just go from uh, minus 80 up to zero. Try drawing the chart again. So it took out all those weird results. And here we see the phase between the input and the output. And I get the, some of the weird results because the signal difference between the input and the output is, is a lot. So once it gets down to these really low signal levels, it has difficulty working out what the phase is. Uh, but the important thing is, again, for the frequency uh, RC filter, the resonance point is uh, where it's about 45 degrees out of sync. And again, we see it's about 498 hertz which is the result I was expecting so good way to get uh, bowed and uh, bowed charts out of this. I'll just give you one more demonstration. So the last thing I used this for was to do some battery discharge check, uh, tests and again uh, I want to compare what the discharge rate and characteristics are for an AA battery between a normal alkaline battery and a nickel metal hydride uh, uh, battery, rechargeable battery, because uh, I'm thinking I'm going to change all my alkaline ones over to rechargeable ones. Uh, so basically the same thing, I created a script already, I called it battery. The thing with this is uh, the reason you want to automate is it takes a long time to discharge a 
battery depending on how fast you're discharging it so I actually ran this over about two days duration uh, just took a step every 31 seconds didn't need the signal generator and all I was doing was uh, let me reduce the size of me was getting the measurements uh, from the volt uh, digital voltmeter just getting the volt DC so generated up the same sort of uh, Python script again saved it and ran that and kind of the results I saw so I actually renamed all these depending on the kind of battery I was working on uh, but let's look for where I was using uh, 10 ohm uh, resistive load on the batteries and for an alkaline battery if I graph timestamp against the voltage I saw draw the chart and you can see here is the alkaline battery discharge rate and you see it drops off fairly quickly near the bottom of its uh, capacity here and I compared this against same sort of thing but for nickel metal hydride battery uh, discharging into into uh, 10 ohms as well and you see some of the characteristic differences so the net nickel metal hydride rechargeable battery uh, maintains its voltage level right through almost until it gets to where it's run out of capacity so that's a good useful thing to have for a battery um, and I can see how long it took to discharge as well um, so that's good uh, I could compare do I want to swap over and basically the answer was yes that I get almost the same capacity between the nickel nickel metal hydride rechargeables I'd use and kind of a normal alkaline but having the uh, ability to recharge them and then uh, the rechargeables maintaining their voltage much longer m makes it uh, more useful for use in things like remote controls. Started looking into how you connect up to the various test instruments I found the two key terms are uh, what's called Skippy SCPI and visa interfaces and they seem to just run at two different layers of the the protocol to talk to test instruments so test instruments usually expose their automation ability via like a usb port or an rs232 port um, or some use tcp ip um, visa seems to do a good job of uh having a standard uh, API for talking to these things and then the way you talk to the actual instrument is through uh, standard commands for programmable instruments or Skippy and uh, those are what I need to send to the instruments to get them to do different things although Skippy is meant to be fairly consistent across uh, instruments and uh, in practice for my ones that I didn't find they were so uh, there were small variations in how it gets implemented so in my project, uh, like I said, I put this together on a Raspberry Pi Zero. We'll have a look at that in a second. But uh, that's about all the hardware that's involved is a Raspberry Pi Zero W and a USB dongle. And the rest of this is just a software-based project. Um, and the key thing I'm using here is a thing called Pi Visa, which allows me to have an API to talk to the test instruments. And it takes care of the complicated stuff like connecting to either a TCP or a, a USB interface in my case. Um, some of the other things I used here was I put together a custom Angular application uh, to provide the frontier when we just saw that and then that talks through web services to a custom Python program that's uh, providing web services and again for that I'm using some standard APIs, fast API and Uvicon as a web server. So the hardware side of uh, Scappy Pi is pretty easy. It's just a Raspberry Pi Zero W and a USB hub. And then I did some 3D prints of a box and then a way to run the wire through the box. Let's have a look at the architecture. So I've got this block diagram here to help with the architecture. So the architecture is basically a client server type application. The server part is running on uh, Pi Zero uh, 2W device and we just saw the hardware and we can see that little device out there uh, that's running Linux 
And then the client side of it is an Angular web client, uh, and I'm calling that Skippy Pi UI. Let's look at the server part first. So the server part's task is to expose the various test instruments here and allow running of automation scripts. Uh, these test instruments talk to the uh, or connect to the Raspberry Pi using either a USB interface or TCP, the two oscilloscopes use TCP interface. And that's the nice thing about this Pi Visa library is it provides a common way of talking to all these instruments. Uh, so once connected, then it uses uh, mostly Skippy commands, although there's some variation here. So the uh, signal generator doesn't use Skippy commands. It's got its own uh, language for talking to that. But for the others, it uses Skippy commands, but it, there's even variation across uh, devices on what the actual Skippy uh, commands look like. They look close, but f even for the two oscilloscopes, there's slightly different ways of asking for different measurements. So the way I uh, hid that was create a separate library for each of the devices. I implemented these as classes and uh, gives me a common way of doing things like connect to the device and asking for setting its configuration and asking for a measurement for the device. So these libraries do that. Uh, then the two main users of these libraries is the WebPy script and this WebPy script implements the fast API API so that's a way of making web services so it's just a thin layer between fast API which is, exposes web services and the functionality that you want to expose as uh, web services which comes from these the classes down here so we've got WebPy fast API uh, is providing the smarts for providing uh, web services and then all that's running within a UV corn web server, which is a nice little Linux uh, web server. The other thing that talks to these uh, devices down here are any scripts or automation scripts I create. And they're just, again, Python scripts. So I run those and it connects to the various classes it needs. I may also use the helper function to do special things like save files, uh, do things like that, and uh, creates a result file. So that's just about everything that's happening up on the web server in the Raspberry Pi Zero. And then over on the Angular web client, uh, exposes three main pieces of functionality, uh, viewing the devices, getting some readings off the devices, uh, automation uh, functionality, so for creating automation scripts, saving them, running them, and then a charts uh, capability where it can take the results of running one of those automation scripts and charting it. Let's do a walkthrough of the code on the server side. So this is what's ra running on the Raspberry Pi 0W. Uh, so I'm using uh, Remote Explorer for this. Um, so using Remote Explorer, I can connect to my uh, Raspberry Pi here. Uh, seeing I've already done it, I can just open Recent. So it uses SSH to talk to the Raspberry Pi. First, it needs to log in. So let me give it a password. And I'm logging in as the Pi user. And one more time, I think this is for the terminal connection down the bottom. Okay, so we're all connected in. Uh, let's have a quick look at how this is set up as a project. So uh, I have the whole thing set up with, synced up with GitHub, and I'll put the link down in the description for my GitHub repository for this. Uh, so the general layout is I tried to use subfolders to uh, keep things a bit neater. So at the top level, I've got a subfolder for all the libraries I'm using. And we'll have a look at those. Uh, and then for the actual operation, uh, the results from any of the automation goes into this results folder as JSON file files. Uh, the definition of any automations I called schemas, so that goes into the schemas folder. Any scripts I create, and you see they're all Python scripts, go into the scripts folder. Um, this folder here, Sketches, was just uh, for where I'm doing some throwaway code. I'll leave it in the project, but uh, it's for things like uh, 
uh, just testing things out when I was getting going with uh, using Pi Visa. And this folder here, static, this is where the actual Angular application I create goes. So this will be served up from using the web server as well. Uh, so when I do a build over on the Angular side, I can move the built files over here and this will be my actual website that it uses. Uh, other things in here, let's have a look at setup sh. Uh, so this is how I set up a new Raspberry Pi W. So if I haven't installed anything on it yet, it shows me, uh, reminds me how to uh, configure Git and GitHub, and then uh, where to uh, pull the files, do the initial clone from the repository. I just commented all that out because you do that before you call this uh, routine. And then we've got the setup sh file, so you can just do a bash on this, bash setup sh. And I'll run through the rest of the setup. So some of the things it's updating is first it updates and upgrades the Raspberry and operating system and any uh, supporting libraries there. Uh, update and installs uh, Python and pip. Uh, installs uh, the GPIO interface. Uh, installs uh, Again, GPIO uh, installs what it needs for the Pi Visa library. I also install uh, uh, these tools, which allow me to do uh, uh, checks on the USB interface. I uh, install Fast API, which is a Python library. I install um, UVCon. Uh, which is the web server. And then down here, this shows how to set up the UVCon service in the uh, in the system D system folder. So this allows UVCon to be started up automatically when the uh, Raspberry Pi starts up. So those are the steps I do to install the UVCon service. And uh, let's have a look here. This is the actual file that's used for the UVCon service. So this is tells it how to actually start up the UVCon service and point it at where I've defined the fast API uh, interface, this web app. And we get to the web app. So the web app, web.py, is what uh, fast API uses to define the services that I'm using. So I import all the libraries I'm going to use. So things like uh, standard things like time and sys and async IO and things. And that's one of the reasons I'm using Fast IO, Fast API, because it uh, has good support for Sync IO. Uh, some of the supporting libraries for Fast API, those classes that we looked at earlier for uh, interfacing to, through Pi Visa to the various uh, test instruments that I'm going to control. Uh, fires up uh, Fast API. To, uh, or, Initiates it as an app, as called app, and then uh, runs through and creates services for each of the type of devices that I'm going to connect to. So basically, uh, puts a wrapper, and these are Flask-style web service wrappers. So the syntax looks much the same uh, for connecting to the, uh, in this case, the Owen. XDM1241 multimeter and the services that I expose through that class. Same thing for the signal generator and the two oscilloscopes. And the last thing to look at here, so there's some servers, services for some of the helper functions too, so not directly to do with the, um, the devices I'm controlling. These are for like more like file saves and running automations and things like that. But this final command here is app mount. So this, uh, if none of the other uh, routes here match, when person requests a service, then it's going to use uh, this instruction. So it's going to look for things that are under the static directory and serve that up. So this is the way we serve up the, the Angular app. 
Uh, let's have a look at one of the device interface libraries. Uh, and I'm going to look at this one here, the XDM1241. This is the multimeter that got me started on this. Uh, so I have two files or two uh, scripts for each uh, device. So I've got this tester script, which allows me to just do a check that the library's working. Uh, I won't get into that in depth, but uh, if I make changes to the code, I can run the tester script just to make sure it's generally still working. But this is the actual uh, uh, libraries and classes that I set up for each of the devices. And although they may do some things a little different, the general uh, uh, interface to them is kind of similar between the devices. This kind of hides some of the complexity of each of the device. Um, so again, for this multimeter, uh, at the beginning I've put a comment about where you can find more information uh, about uh, programming the the device. So I've got this for each of the types of devices. So this usually has the skippy commands in the PDF. Uh, I set each of these interfaces up as a class. So this class is called XDM1241. You'll see the same for the other classes. Uh, so to start with, I initialize the resource manager. This is the Pi Visa resource manager. And then when a connect is issued, it'll go out and it'll tr actually try this, in this case, by default, uh, five times. It'll go through the loop uh, trying to, to connect to the device. Sometimes it doesn't connect uh, on the first try. And this is where some of the things are different because this is USB. It'll go and look for in the USB uh, resources. So in the resource manager, you can list the resources. So I look for the U USB one, and then I'm going to look for one that is actually has the words XDM1241 in the in the resource ID. And I'm issuing the skippy command ID in, which is a standard one for getting the device to return its ID information. So this is how I, in this case, differentiate the XDM1241 from the other USB device, which is the signal generator. So I go through, try this, uh, try this until either I get a good connection or it's gone through the loop uh, five times. Uh, once it's connected, uh, then the, the self XDM1241 has a value in it. Uh, so if I try another connect, it'll, it'll just drop through this, say it's already connected. Uh, for the XDM1241, the multimeter, there's two main sets of commands. One's to configure the device, to put it into the mode that you want it to run in, whether it's, it's a voltmeter, ohm meter, uh, uh, AC voltmeter, amp meter, whatever I want it to do. And I'm using the configure command and I'm setting that uh, three variables, type, range, and rate. So type is uh, what type of configuration I want it to go into. So say volt DC or volt AC is a type. Range, I can either set it to a specific range or I can just leave it as auto. In most cases, I just leave this as auto. And then rate is how fast it uh, acquires the data. So these uh, digital voltmeters, they can have uh, slower acquisition rates, uh, but be more accurate. So uh, I may set this rate to be fast in some cases where I'm taking lots of readings quickly, where I'm not so concerned about accuracy, or I may just set it to the uh, slow rate. And what this is doing is converting what I'm requesting into the a string that is the actual skippy command for this. So it builds up a skippy command here, send it sends it to the to the multimeter in this case. And it'll also test that I'm getting the measure back that I was expected after the the, the setup. Um, so something like a multimeter, even for automation, I probably only set this uh, once. I usually won't be jumping between uh, volts and say frequency uh, in the same automation script. So usually I just set this up once. So uh, the config is usually just done once in an automation script, but the measure is done multiple times and again for this multimeter uh, I had a couple of ways of getting the measure I can get the measure just as a raw number 
oh, so I can get a lot more details about uh, what's been returned in the measure. You know, what's the unit of measure uh, being returned? So whether it's ohms, mega ohms, whether it's volts, milli millivolts. Uh, so that's the difference between these two uh, types of getting the measure. And one thing I wanted to show was, uh, let's see it here. This here, so this is again kind of the weirdness that I ran into with the device. For the 60M1241 multimeter, I found that uh, the internal encoding is uh, uh, extended Unicode Chinese because uh, it actually comes from Hong Kong. Uh, so until I worked out to change the encoding method to request the measure, uh, some of the special symbols like the ohm sign and the degree sign was uh, blowing up in the, when I tried to get the, the measure, measure back. Um, so be aware of that and you may have to fiddle around and do some low level investigation to find out what the encoding method is of the actual device um so that's about it and you'll see uh most of these look similar let's have a look at the uh, sds1241 that's kind of a simpler one it didn't have so many commands to do but you'll see the connect actually follows the same sort of idea but in this case i'm connecting via tcp to a specific tcp address uh, and i get the measures and uh, do some configuration of the uh, skippy string I'm sending to it as well and last one to look at here is this just the signal generator this signal generator was a weird one where it didn't actually follow sort of standard skippy command so uh, again there was a programming manual out there for it so I put the link in for that but this was uh, very non skippy uh, commands that you sent to it so I send things like uh, w23 which meant special things about uh, setting the signal generator to different waveforms and things. Okay, now let's have a look at the Angular uh, client for this. Uh, so this one I called Skippy underscore UI for uh, the user interface. And like I showed with the server, this gets served up from the static uh, folder. Uh, so it's a separate project to, to actually build the project. And then I do a build uh, once I've got the project Angular application running and it builds and puts the results of the build into this distribution file and these files here are the ones that I transfer to the static uh, folder on the server uh, to be served up. Uh, so this follows kind of a normal sort of uh, structure for an Angular application. Um, so at the top level of the user interface, let's have a look at this app component HTML. It uses a uh, uh, material design tab uh, control to have three tabs at the top. So this is where the devices, automation, and charts tabs are, are created. And inside each of those tabs are the three applications that represent the functionality on those tabs. So this uh, app devices, app automation, and uh, app chart. So let's have a look at uh, the next level down say this app devices so there's a devices component here open that and the HTML for this uh, shows uh, using a material design expansion panel uh, to home house each of the four devices that I've provided functionality for so for the multimeter frequency signal generator and the two oscilloscopes they each have a separate expansion panel which are expanded by default but in the user interface I can collapse some of these if I'm not using them don't want to see them uh, so that's the devices tab um, and you'll see inside each of the uh, expansion panels there's a component for each of the devices so uh, app xdm1241 app jds6600 for the signal generator and the two oscilloscope devices here so if you want to see those let me go into the the component for the xdm here same sort of thing html at the top level 
and I tried to follow the same sort of layout we saw it in the when we were looking through the user interface uh, displays uh, a panel on the left hand side of the uh, web page to show that what the current readings are and then buttons for setting each of the the values that you want to set for uh, in this case the multimeter what you're going to measure and then there's a optional button that shows up when you select one of the measurements and it's getting the measurements where you can add that measurement to the automation script that you're working on at the moment so it comes up with a plus meter button and we saw that earlier as well so you'll see all these sort of the follow the same idea let's look at uh, the SDS same sort of idea a lot of buttons and then uh, add the the thing we're metering uh, to the automation script at the end. Uh, let's have a quick look at uh, what the code looks like for this and they will follow the same sort of idea. So one thing because I'm using Angular 17 I've gone to using uh, the standalone option so that means I declare all the uh, dependencies in this component. There's not sort of a higher level uh, uh, shared dependency uh, definition. So here's where I I define the the various uh, libraries and things I'm using. So things like the material uh, components that I'm using I declare here and the services I'm using. Uh, so in this case the service that I'm using for this uh, SDS 1052 which is an oscilloscope is I uh, during the constructor I import the STS 1052 service and in my services if we look at that we'll see it's just using our HTTP client to be able to call the web services for the SDS 1052 that I uh, created in the server we saw that a bit earlier and then just uh, put together a command for connecting to it uh, one thing to be aware of this host and port so uh, I need to tell the Angular client where to find the services and I do that by up in the let's see app config TS this is where the globals things that are used globally across the application are defined so this is where I say that the services are located at this location uh, so if you go and give things a different name then you'll need to update the host and port uh, information there. Uh, let's have a look at the automation page. So again using a lot of material design components. Uh, I have code here that uh, things start appearing depending on what you're doing. Uh, the main interesting piece of code is probably this is loading so I flip the page between uh, showing a way of selecting uh, definitions or schemas of uh, automation scripts that I've already defined being able to pull one of those in or else just working on on the script and the is loading uh, variable is the one that triggers it's showing one thing or the other and again I'm in angular 17 so I can use this at if uh, command in the HTML which is kind of neat to 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 have different parts of HTML show up depending on a, vari a setting for a variable. Uh, last thing I have a look at is just the charts component and the chart component uh, again has parts of the page that start to appear as you load a results uh, file that you want to uh, uh, chart and then depending on what things you're going to chart uh, the easiest way I found of doing this is actually uh, having separate definitions for the charts line ch chart uh, uh, component so I'm using the ngx charts uh, component to do the charting but you see here I'm, again I'm using the at if to display uh, different versions of the charting control uh, depending on in this case what the access is so for frequency I wanted to show uh, logarithmic scale on the x x axis so if it sees frequency as the x axis uh, 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 series then it uh, 
we'll use a logarithmic uh, routine to to lay out uh, the frequencies on the on the chart. And same sort of thing if I'm using a timestamp as my x-axis, then I wanted to format it a little different. So there's some formatting here uh, based on the on the timestamp. Otherwise, all other charts uh, accesses just use this as standard chart layout. Uh, last thing I'll have a look at here is if you work on this, I used I create a service for automation. So among other things, this holds uh, holds a variable called underscore automation, which follows this format for automation. So this is the definition of a automation. Uh, script so the things that I need to know the most important thing is it's kind of the list of meters here and this can be saved away and re, re, uh, restored uh, as we saw on the automation page um, and then the other interesting thing in here is this generate uh, command or function so this will generate a Python script based on what the automation parameters are so it does a whole lot of uh, sort of just fiddly code where it uh, generates Python code uh, based on what the automation definition is. So this is the Python code that gets generated. Um, and my idea with this was that, you know, I can create a Python script. I don't have to uh, create a scripting engine that does everything. So because it's in Python, once I've created the script, if I want to do special fiddly things down in the script, I can just go into the script and then modify it after this. But this gets mostly working, well, the scripts will work, but if I, um, it will cover most of the use cases like creating Bode uh, charts and things like that. Uh, with this, just the basic scripts it creates, but if I want to get some different measurements or combinations of measurements, I can add it into the Python script after I've created the script. Yeah, I just wanted to look at some other charting options. So I can download the JSON file uh, for one of the results. This is an example of a Bode uh, JSON file. Then in, from Excel, I can, in data mode, I can import the JSON file. So I'll import the one I just downloaded. And if it thinks it's a valid JSON file, it'll bring up a wizard for converting it to Excel data. So first I convert it to a table. And I can expand it to see the columns in the table. That looks good. So I can tell it loaded into Excel. And now I can see the various, ser various series in that data. So I can select the frequency and the peak to peak values, insert a Excel chart based on that data. So this is where I can create customized charts and I can actually uh, chart if I want more than one set of data on one chart, which might be useful for Bode plots as well. So here I can change it around, change the titles, uh, I can change the, in this case, the x-axis. So I'll tell it I want to format the frequencies on a logarithm, logarithmic scale. And I could do the same thing for the voltages as well, make those logarithmic. <laughs> so you can see here, uh, bringing it into something like Excel gives you a lot more options for, for charting. 